Very good morning, good afternoon, or uh, good evening, depending on your time zone. My name is Dominique Bergeron, I'm the director of the FA Horizon Geneva, and I will be moderating this um, today's session. Let me start by thanking you all for taking the time to attend today's session. And uh, we really appreciate your support and interest in, in what we do. As you may already know, FA Geneva is organizing a church dialogue collaboration with the FAO market and market division. And to this series, our objective is to share information on relevant and timely topics relevant to related to agricultural trade and businesses. Before introducing our speaker, I would like to briefly touch upon the topic for today's presentation. As you all know, trade plays an important role in providing sufficient, diverse, and food. It also generates income and employment for farmers, workers, and traders in the entire agriculture and food industry. Since 1995, agriculture trade has more than doubled in volume and Today, more countries trade with each other. The share of production traded for agricultural commodities has been also gradually increasing over time. According to the latest OECD FAO agricultural outlook, covering the, the, the period 2023-2032, the share of uh, production traded has risen from an average of 15% in 2000 to 23% in the baseline period 2020-2022. Dominique, ex excuse me, I interrupt you. Your sound sound is not very clear. Um, okay. No, we we cannot hear you. No. Can you hear me better? Yes, it is better right okay, now. Okay. Thank you very I'm, much. I'm really sorry. Shall, shall I start again, or? If you don't mind, maybe we can. We can. Uh... <laughs> Okay. Okay. Very good. Let me do it then. I'm, I and I apologize to the participants. I was not aware of this problem. So, as I said, good morning and warm welcome to this briefing. Uh, and of course, I would like to thank you all for participating and for your interest in this in this briefing. As you already know, FAO in Geneva is organizing trade dialogues in collaboration with the FAO Market and Trade Division. And through this series, our objective is to share information on relevant and timely topics related to agricultural trade and food security. And uh, I would like to, to say a few words on, on today's briefing session. As you know, trade plays an important role in providing sufficient diverse and nutritious food. It also uh, generates incomes and employment for farmers, workers, and traders in the entire agricultural and food industry across countries. As a matter of fact, since 1995, food and agricultural trade has more than doubled in volume and in calories. Today, small country, uh, uh, more, more, more countries trade with each other. The share of production traded for agricultural commodities has been also uh, gradually increasing over time. According to the latest OECD FAO Agricultural Outlook, which covers the period 2023-2032, the share of production traded has risen from an average of 15% in 2000 to 23% in the baseline period 2020-2022. Trade is closely linked to food security. Indeed, the 2030 Agenda recognizes the key role of trade in addressing food security, nutrition, and sustainable agriculture. Food security exists, as you know, when all people at all time have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food that meets their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. Agricultural trade can help improve food security in its different dimension. On the other hand, the food security situation in a country or region can also be uh, severely impacted when trade is disrupted. With this background, today's session will focus on the recent shipping disruptions to trade with implication for global food security situation. 
Before starting, and as usual, I would like to share some details regarding the logistic and housekeeping for this virtual session, uh, which will be held in English with no interpretation. It will be recorded and will be shared with the participants along with the presentation relevant to this session. It is uh, scheduled to last for about uh, 45 minutes. Uh, we have reserved some time uh, toward the end of the session uh, for questions, and we ask you to submit those questions in the Q&A module. Do not use the, the chat box that is not activated, so please use the Q&A module. Kindly state your name and organization or institution, and we will try to accommodate as many uh, questions as possible, uh, either in writing or orally during the session. So that's it for housekeeping, and let me introduce our uh, speakers uh, today. And we are very pleased to have two eminent colleagues from uh, joining from our headquarter in Rome, Mr. Boubacar Ben Belhassen, uh, who is the director of FAO uh, Market and Trade Division, and whom I'm sure many of you know, and Ms. Monica Totova, uh, who is a senior economist uh, within that FAO uh, Market and, and Trade Division, and who is also serving as the secretary of the Agricultural Market Information System, which you all know, in short, AMIS. So without taking much time, now I would like to, to give the floor to Monica uh, for our presentation. Monica, the floor is yours. Warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dominique, for the introduction. I hope everybody can hear me loud and clear. Since I'm a bit uh, technologically challenged, Pinan agreed to operate the, the presentation. So we can go to the first slide, Pinan. Thank you very much. Good afternoon from Rome. Warm welcome to everyone. I'm particularly delighted to see colleagues from other international organizations. And I hope at the end they will also, should there be room, participate in the discussion and uh, answer questions based on their analysis. So shipping as an integral part of moving goods, would they be food commodities, spare parts, inputs for industrial production, medicines, etc., etc., from producers to consumers. As it is often the case when logistical systems, including shipping, run smoothly, they do not receive much attention. However, they become more evident once there are disruptions or problems that arise. Shipping, considering that by definition, it is impacted by nature and by typhoons, by weather development, etc., etc. However, impacts of those natural events are usually very short lived and rather localized. So, uh, if you allow me a few words about the agricultural trade in general before we delve into the briefing. More than 80% of the world trade in grains and oil seeds is shipped by the sea. And typically, this is done by drag bulk carriers. Drag bulk carriers are differentiated on their tonnage, that way tonnage. And they can transport a variety of cargoes from agricultural commodities, fertilizer, iron and oil, coal, cement, all sorts of things that can be transported in bulk. Thus, the shipments for agricultural commodities are, for lack of better word, competing with the demand from the industrial sector. Most of the listeners will be familiar, familiar with the vocabulary, but in case not, we are using labels like Supermax, Handy Size, Panamax, Cape Size to qualify vessels based on their tonnage. All the vessels, of course, are the commissions. New vessels enter the market, and this is usually the size of the, the availability for the shipping is determined by the demand from non-agricultural sectors. According to the shipping industry reports, there is still excess capacity in the shipping industry right now. Some agricultural commodities, for example, rice, tend to be shipped more in the containers. Also, agricultural commodities depends, the choice whether bulk or container would also depend on the size of the market. 
Generally, the, the smaller market, also less matured market, they might be more inclined to import in containers as opposed to dry bulk, which also has to do with the port infrastructure. Next slide, please. Pinar, we can move to the next slide. I'm, I'm, I'm having some technical issues. I will move to the next slide very, in every bit. All right, thank you. So I will start on the next slide. In the, in the past, we spoke about the, 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 the shock or the disruptions that come from the shipping from the weather events, for example. But in the past four years or so, we also had a number of shocks that were really not anticipated ahead of time. The first one would be the COVID-19 pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic increased demand for the consumer goods, it increased demand for the medical type of goods, which were imported for good rate part from Asia towards other markets, which increased the demand of shipping for shipping, which coupled with the measures introduced to limit the, the spread of the virus, led to delays in shipping and increasing shipping costs. Then in 2021, in March, as you can see on the, the picture on the, on the left side, there was the six-day obstruction of the Suez Canal, which uh, Suez Canal for, for some parts is navigable both ways, but this incident happened in the part which was only navigable one way. So it led to a complete blockage of all transit with more than 430 vessels blocked in this incident. Each additional day of delay was tying up to additional half percent of the global shipping capacity waiting in the queues in the Suez Canal, considering its importance connecting Asia with Europe. So for shipping lines, this resulted in a time cost for the vessels, loss of revenues and loss of capacity as passing the canal with the delay means that you are going to miss the slot in the port you will be calling next, right? So there was this whole buildup in the system which then led to significant delays. And another rather recent example was the disruption of the seaborne train from Ukraine after the Black Sea route from Ukrainian ports was blocked due to the war. So this was the case between February 2022 to February, 20, uh, from February 2022 to July 2022, then following the introduction and implementation of the Black Sea Grain Initiative, things smooth out. The concern that they were present following the cessation of the Black Sea Grain Initiative were somehow mitigated by the restoration on by introduction of a humanitarian corridor that hugs very close with the coastline. Last but not least, and somehow less in the public focus, there have been disruptions in several inland waterways that challenge the transportation in the major agriculture exporting countries, including Rhine in Germany, the Mississippi River in the United States, and the Tapajos River in Brazil. Uh, the situation in the Mississippi River has improved and the drought advisory is no longer in place. Moving to the next slide, let me now focus on the two main shipping bottlenecks that materialized relatively recently, and that would be the Panama Canal and the Red Sea, which facilitate trade of around the fifth of global bulk grain and oil seeds. We can move next. So, going to the Panama Canal. Panama Canal restrictions started a little bit earlier, since about uh, July 2023, but they were relatively minor, and then they progressively worsened towards the end of 2023. The Panama Canal transports about 5% of global maritime trade, and the most affected sectors would be petroleum, chemical, and non-metallic mineral products. 
Panama Canal, contrary to popular belief, is not exactly a straight canal. So, in this light and engineering feat, covers approximately 80 kilometers between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, and it is a system of locks. And these locks, with the, with the doors that act as lifts, need fresh water to actually work, as you see on the picture on the left-hand side. So even without the record drought, the country experienced in 2003, the population growth in the country means that the demand for the fresh water in 2023 is much higher than it was in 1914 when these locks were being built. So the water comes from the Gutton Lake in the middle, and under normal conditions, the Panama Canal would facilitate transport of about 13,000 to 14,000 vessels each year, which translates between the 35 and 38 vessels daily. Next slide, please. So the water levels resulting from extreme droughts, and that was also exacerbated by the El Nino event, capped the number and the size of the vessels that were passing through these Panama, Panama Canal locks. The first reductions were introduced in July 2023. By January 2024, they reached nearly 40% of the volumes of one year ago, leading to extended waiting times and diversions, especially for tankers and dry cargos. As it turns out, the, the companies that are, uh, let's say, uh, loyal customers that pass the, the Panama Canal more often with big cargoes, they can actually book slots. So there is a different treatment slightly because they bring more traffic. The latest revision, which was published last week, now allows for transit of 27 vessels per day, which is still lower. There has been also an auction for the slots so the fees for passing the canal have actually increased. Next slide, please. Transit, it is an important, the Panama Canal is an important point for the transit of shipments of grain oil seeds from the U.S. Gulf Coast to the destination of Asia, as well as horticulture products originating from Chile, Peru, to the U.S. East Coast, and then also to Europe. As I mentioned, container traffic is affected, but relatively less because they can book a slot or they can alternatively unload the cargo. It's not an easy feast, but it can be done to unload the container and pass it uh, through rail, which cannot really be done so easily uh, for dry bulk commodities. So the altern alternatives in place are you either do a longer journey, you use intermodal transportation, or in case of U.S., instead of shipping from the Gulf, the goods could be shipped towards Asia, which is a significant market, from the U.S. West Coast. However, constraints, include, uh, constraints that are imposed by domestic shipping capacity on limiting the use of these alternative options. The chart you see on the left, it affects, it's a, it was a simulation done by IMF, and it assesses the volume of traffic flows at the risk of being affected by the disruption to shipping in the Panama Canal. So basically, you see the vessels or the ports from which the vessels passing to, through the Panama Canal either originate or where they are heading. Next slide, please. Moving to the Red Sea, you will notice that for Red Sea, I use the term disruption 
while for the Panama Canal, I use the word restriction, right? So in the, the, the Panama Canal, what happens is that the Panama Canal Authority actually sets up the number of vessels that can pass depending on the availability of the lake, of the main lake that is feeding the locks. Now, the shipping got more expensive and you might need to pay more for the transit. You might need to auction for the spot to pass the Panama Canal, but you are aware of this existing bottleneck and there is a certain degree of transparency and predictability if you wish. This is the situation, this is what you are going to pay, this is when you are going to pass, all right? What is happening in Red Sea is more of a shipping disruption considering its uncertainty that is associated with it. So since uh, the attacks on commercial vessels in the Red Sea have, taken, have been taking place since about mid-December 2023, this passage secures up to 15% of global maritime trade. The most affected sectors are energy products, mostly crude oil and LPG, and uh, as it was the case in the Panama Canal, chemical and non-metallic mineral products. It is an important shipping route connected, connecting Indian Ocean with Mediterranean Sea via the uh, via Red Sea and the Suez Canal. Next slide, please. So there have been more than 50 attacks since November 2023. Uh, the latest information covering the first decade of March indicates that many time shipping through the Suez Canal has decreased even further in March with the estimated transit volumes down over 60% in the first decade compared to the 55% in February. In total, shipping volume equivalent to about 1.5% of 2023 global maritime trade has been diverted away from the Red Sea, and this rerouting efficiently began in uh, mid-December. So what is this 1.5% of the global maritime trade? It is equivalent to about 2,100 vessels, Scanning an estimated 180 million metric tons of goods, any goods, right? We are not talking specifically about agriculture. In this case, it is any cargo. And you observe it right there on the slide that the number of calls, number of passings through the Bab al Mandeb Strait, and then also some vessels will stay unload in the Red Sea, for example, in the Jeddah airport, some will continue towards Suez Canal, but the calls have declined in both cases. Next slide, please. As the calls decline in the Bab El Mandeb and the Suez Canal, the calls in the Cape of Good Hope have increased. So several shipping companies responded to the threat of attacks by rerouting maritime traffic. Uh, reports, anecdotal evidence are beginning to emerge indicating bottlenecks around the route that goes around the Cape of Good Hope since traditionally this route has not been a cast or a more recently it has not been accustomed to increased level of traffic volumes. Right? So if we compare it, the tra transit volume increased by 108% compared to last year in the Cape of Good Hope in the first decade of March. We can move to the next slide when we go and talk about the, the implications. So the events in the Red Sea 
have already or they impacted very rather early on the global value change and delayed the deliveries of components in the just-in-time delivery system, which are important for the industrial sector. For agriculture and commodities, this passage is important to secure the export of grains and oil seeds from the EU, the Russian Federation, Ukraine, to Asia and East Africa. Similarly, rice and other commodities head eastwards from Asia. Fertilizer trade, including potash from Russian Federation to Asia, also transits through the Red Sea. Rice tends to be tends to be shipped in the containers, as I have mentioned. So uh, the, the the shipping, according to the calculations that were done early on by the colleagues in the IGC, calculated that rerouting grain deliveries, bulk grain deliveries, from Europe to Asia via Cape of Good Hope at an estimated 10, 15 days of journey time and about 10 US dollars per ton to freight costs. There are extra costs for, for example, LPG tra uh, tankers that would be carrying liquid ammonia because they pose additional risk. There would be extra costs or the cost of diversion would be high for perishable products that need to be and refrigerated net to be, etc., etc. Even if vessels are not rerouted, the insurance cost for passing the straight uh, pump element depth have been reported to have increased, increased, although the cost of insurance is often considered proprietary and not as easy to not as easy to to obtain. The early attacks were directed at the container vessels. Uh, Hanana, in January 2024, it was a dry bar carrier, then it was an oil carrier that was hit. And uh, uh, one of the most significant ones was the, was the dry, uh, it was in about mid February, 18th of February, there was a dry bar carrier which was carrying about 21,000 tons of ammonium phosphate sulfur fertilizer. The crew eventually escaped unharmed, but the vessel sunk on the 2nd of March, leaking not only fertilizer, but also fuel and heavy oils and you name it, whatever is on a, on a vessel, raising concerns about environmental disaster and impact on the fishing livelihoods. So the environmental implications, actually, there is more than one. There is this direct implication from, uh, from uh, pollution from the vessels that might be hit in the process or were hit in the Red Sea. But there is also the impact of the longer shipping route. As the longer shipping route might take extra 10, 15 days or longer, depending how the situation is going to develop, obviously the vessels are traveling, coming longer journeys, and they are using, emitting more CO2 emissions. But also to make up for the lost time, they will go faster. And if they are going to go faster, they are emitting more per unit than they would have done uh, otherwise. There is also a danger, which was up to recently was a theoretical danger of increasing potential for piracy attacks in areas. Just earlier this week, there was a vessel carrying coal, which was indeed uh, uh, attacked by pirates. So we can move to the next slide. I think I have a technical problem again. I will, okay. I will do it. I don't know what's happening, but you know, I apologize for that. So what this means, what this means is that first think about Egypt. While in Panama, Panama Canal, they are 
the vessels are passing and they might be auctioning for the bidding for how much they pay for the passage, Egypt actually is, for them, the Suez Canal is the main source of foreign currency with a direct macroeconomic impact on its economy. The Suez Canal revenue in January was down by 47%, which was a loss of uh, almost 350,000 million US dollars. There is also a concern, while for grains and oil seeds, if the shipping using longer route takes longer, those are cargoes that are not perishable, right? It's going to cost more to transit it, but considering the nature of the product, there is not this immediate danger of product going wrong. This is not the case on the perishable products and live animals, which this is the time of the year that the shipments of live animals from, for example, Australia to Near East are going strong in preparation during the Ramadan and preparation for the upcoming Eid. So, uh, New Zealand banned exports of live sheep via sea at the end of 2022, but Australia is considering this ban, but is still exporting this live sheep. Looking at the trade data, these show already now a significant decline in live sheep exports already in the last quarter of 2023, comparing uh, to last quarter of 2022, there was a decline of about 20%. In January, the trade data we have now indicate only shipments to Malaysia and Indonesia. There are similar impacts also on the chilled and uh, frozen meat sectors. Uh, it also creates issues if you are going to, for example, deliver the live animals or whatever cargo into ports that are in the Red Sea but you, don't, you are not going to cross the Suez Canal. So if you were exporting, for example, meat from Australia to Saudi Arabia and you would unload it on Jeddah, it is not quite possible. I mean, it is possible now if you are going to take the risk. So you would unload in Daman, in the Persian Gulf, and then track the containers to the destination and then again track empty containers back to the to the to the port of Daman so they can be again put into the system. Right? Which leads into the delays, but it also leads to increased costs. Traditionally, the higher demand during the, the Ramadan and Eid usually pushes the prices even higher. So combination of these two factors can lead into additional increases in the food prices. Also, as of now, as of now, we have not the energy prices have hold, have held up. There have not been significant changes in the energy prices. However, we all know that agriculture is a very energy intensive sector. You need the fuel for agriculture operations, but you also need the energy to produce fertilizer, to produce agricultural inputs, etc., etc. Should there be another stock that would put the energy prices higher, this would have an impact on the agriculture, on the prices of agriculture inputs. Last, moving on, um, the Red Sea, these disruptions in the Red Sea could impact the competitiveness of different origins, which means that for Asian customers, for example, if they have to pay higher premiums or they have to pay higher shipping costs, 
the destination from the Black Sea and other European zones uh, origin might not be as attractive, and instead they might be sourcing their needs from the American continent or even from Australia. Right? The first, considering the, the landscape, the first concerns the impact of these increased cost of shipping, the first sort usually goes to Yemen. Yemen imports 90, 95% of its food. And if they have to pay more for the shipping to get the goods in, this will have impact on the country's economy. Despite the disruption, we have not yet observed this decline in the import, for import flows. And in January, actually, compared to the, the previous two years, the volume of the imports that got to the Yemen ports have actually slightly increased by about 10%. However, eventually, this higher cost of freight and insurance will put an upward pressure on the prices. The next slide. We only have two more slides left. Thank you. So, well, how this is going to what this is going to mean for the consumer prices depends on the on a on a variety of factors which are on place. In several countries, higher shipping costs will likely impact food import bits and subsequently retail prices. Of course, it will depend whether the FOB, which is the export prices, whether they can absorb some of the increases in the shipping costs, all right? Now, if they can absorb some of the increases in the shipping costs, this will mean the producers aren't going to be paid less. And as I will show on the next slide, the producer prices or the, the export prices generally have been declining. If producers receive even less for their products, which considering that the markets are now relatively well supplied, they will, in the, when it comes to time to plant again in the future, they will reconsider how much they are going to plant if the prices are lower. And this could have, info, could have implication on the production decisions for the future. We have uh, already spoken about uh, the, the, the transportation. What is also, uh, there is quite a bit of interest in looking for alternative shipping routes. There has been quite an increasing interest in the rail transportation across Euro-Asia, transiting goods from China via Russian Federation. Right? Uh, discussions on the India-Middle East-Europe corridor, which were started in about uh, September last year, the ongoing shipping disruptions are adding additional fuel, additional impetus to this discussion of creating a land corridor, of course, those are discussions that are more for the longer run. Now, going to the last slide, I just wanted to show you what I have already mentioned before, but graphically, that the food prices generally, the FAO food price index looks at export prices, right? So those have been generally declining, with the exception of sugar that has been quite volatile, but there are underlying supply issues there, while the, the prices of the shipping prices have been increasing. So, Pinar, I will leave it here, and I will be looking forward to questions so uh, we can we have some time left. Thank you. Well, thank you so much indeed, Monica, for, for such a, a comprehensive uh, presentation, providing all the information that is available indeed at your end and a very analytical um, presentation of the, the different uh, constraints that uh, global trade is currently facing. 
So um, I have a question here uh, for you, uh, Monica. And um, in your presentation, you basically touched on a, a variety of factors and concepts, uh, including, you know, generally uh, declining FAO food price index and increasing shipping costs and the implication that this may have. Um, I mean, Geneva, in, here online, we have many uh, trade uh, uh, people from WTO missions, etc. But Geneva is also uh, the world humanitarian capital. And, uh, and, and therefore, when, when you see that sort of disruption, you immediately think that uh, there could be uh, impact in terms of the, of the supply of, uh, of assistance, uh, especially to the over 250 million people who are currently facing uh, acute food insecurity and particular the assistance that is provided by, uh, by WFP and others. Uh, could you please uh, elaborate on, uh, on potential implications on availability of such commodities to be used as, uh, as food assistance and the implications that we may have for, for the countries depending on them? Yes, thank you, Dominique. So uh, there is good news and there is bad news, right? The global export prices are easing, generally speaking. So but at the same time, the agencies that are involved, would it be the WFP, would it be other agencies, are also responsible for the logistical arrangements to move the goods that are then used for food assistance from the, the where they are purchasing it into the into their destinations. So they too are faced with these higher logistical costs and the risks that are associated with it, which under, let's say, traditional circumstances might have not been as challenging because if you are buying a, a large amount, these costs get spread out. However, at the same time, many of the agencies are suffering from budget cuts which is impacting their ability to purchase and to ensure that this, these commodities are distributed to the final consumers. So we are talking about a coincidence of, of two factors here. One is the increased uh, costs that are associated with these uh, supply chain bottlenecks or choke points or whatever you call them. And the second one is the rather declining funding that is available for these operations. So if indeed, and, and right now, let's say we are in a relatively comfortable situation on the global markets. So should there be another shock that would be sending the prices higher and you have these higher shipping costs, combined with the lower funding availability, this will impact the ability of the agencies to actually fulfill the needs that are in the respective countries. Well, very concerning indeed, uh, Monica, and thank you for, for providing more details on that. For everybody information, in around 20 of, uh, of April, we will be coming out with the uh, 2024 edition of the Global Report on Food Prices that will indeed uh, present the, the acute food insecurity situation in which, as you say, uh, double burden, increased cost, and less uh, funding going to that sort of activity. So very concerning in terms of global food insecurity. So colleagues, I don't see any other question in the, in the Q&A uh, module. So I would like to uh, now invite um, Rubaka Ben Belalsen, the, the director of the Trade and Market Division, to, to deliver some uh, words of wisdom in, uh, in concluding remarks. Uh, over to you, uh, Bubaka. We can't hear you, Bubaka. You are muted. Today, we have technical issues. <laughs> yeah, it's a day of technical issues, it seems. Thank you, Dominique. Uh, good afternoon from Rome. Um, dear colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for joining us in this briefing session and for your interest and uh, participation 
Uh, we hope that you found this session informative and then it has contributed to promoting and to gaining a better understanding of the current challenges that face global agricultural supply chains and their possible implication for uh, food security. Uh, as Dominique um, highlighted in his opening, uh, in FAO, we recognize the essential role that international agri-food trade and the global value chains can play in meeting the global food security objectives. And as you know very well, trade is recognized as one of the key means of implementation for the 2030 Agenda and the SDGs. So this highlights the critical importance attached to, to trade. In the 2020 edition of uh, one of the FAO flagship uh, reports and it's um, the flagships, uh, one of them is the State of Agricultural Commodity Markets, what we refer to as SOCO. We have showed very clearly and through empirical data and, and, and estimation that about one third of the world food and agriculture exports are traded within global value chains that involve at least three countries. So this underlines the importance of ensuring the smooth movement of goods between, between the countries. Um, in this con in, it's in this context that in FAO we are strong advocates of the need to ensure small, smooth and well-functioning uh, international trade and supply chains. Uh, this becomes even more important uh, during periods of trade disruptions like the ones that we discussed today and Monica showed very clearly the impacts of, of, of those disruptions uh, and how they can threaten the food security, especially of vulnerable population in different parts of the world. Also, as discussed today, we see that diverse drivers are behind or cause these disruptions. And though some of them have eased, uh, for example, the low water levels in the Mississippi uh, River. In other parts, uh, like in the Panama Canal, low waters continue to constrain the, the crossings uh, with implication for transportation and logistics in major uh, exporting countries. At the same time, uh, security-related disruption in the Red Sea are affecting traffic along the shipping route connecting the Indian Ocean with the, the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, this diversity of the causes and also the complexity of the challenges uh, highlight the need for efficient and sustainable logistics and transportation networks, through, uh, including through partnerships and agreement, uh, knowledge sharing, uh, and appropriate policies that promote robust and resilient supply chain. So these are a very important policy or important recommendation that, that we, 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 we promote in FAO. Market transparency and the provision of up-to-date and reliable or credible information, objective information are essential in this regard and play a key role in fostering the efficiency and resilience of agri-food uh, uh, systems. In FAO, we maintain, we maintain, as I hope you know, a comprehensive market intelligence service for the major agricultural commodities, and we provide regular analysis and assessment with the objective or the aim to facilitate informed policy decision and also to allow uh, timely intervention, especially in uh, periods of crisis or, uh, or, uh, or warnings for looming food security situations. In FAO, and, and uh, Dominique already mentioned this, that we host the Secretariat of the Agricultural Market Information System, AMIS in short, which is a G20 initiative that was established back in 2011 by the G20 Agriculture Ministers uh, following um, the global food price uh, crisis uh, between 2007 and 2010. Uh, AMIS works to enhance transparency by developing methods and indicators to reflect food market uh, development and promotes policy dialogue and uh, coordination. Uh, in, in this regard, uh, in response to a request uh, from the G20 uh, following the disruption created by the outbreak of COVID-19 and also the war in Ukraine, the aim is secretariat, we are developing a work stream uh, that's dedicated to shipping logistics uh, with, the, with the aim to monitor the trade flows of food and this, it's hoped that this should allow us to have good information and uh, to also be able to conduct better and timely assessment of the impacts of trade and shipping disruption. So this is work uh, coming up and, and we hope we'll have the opportunity to present it in a future uh, uh, briefing session. Uh, once again, uh, thank you for joining us today and we look forward to engaging with you in uh, future events. Uh, Dominique, back to you and uh, thank you for the opportunity.
Yeah, thank you very much indeed, Bubaka, for your for your remarks and for informing us on this new uh, work stream that you have in your division. And of course, we'll all be looking forward to uh, to further briefing on on this very very. Uh, important topic. So uh, I take this opportunity, Bubakar, to thank you uh, uh, personally, but also your 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 division colleagues within your division, Monica, for our excellent uh, presentation, and uh, of course, big thank to the to the participants uh, today. Please do not hesitate uh, to to reach out uh, to us should you need uh, any additional information. We will uh, share with you the presentation as well as the recording of the. Of the event um, today, and um, and uh, we wish you a good rest of the afternoon, and and look forward to uh, to your participation in future events. Thank you very much, and goodbye.